this is a this is a reading of the chapter of a book entitled the life and works of theophrastus paracelsus written by franz hartman this is a single chapter from that book entitled cosmology read by devin j morgan three cosmology the power that was active in the formation of the world was god the supreme cause and essence of all things being not only the father of the son but of all created things that ever were that are or will be the elaster footnote one from forest and astra stars or worlds and footnote the primordial and original cause of all existence. This power is, was, and will be the eternal constructor of the world, the carpenter of the universe, the sculptor of forms. Creation took place through the inherent will of that creative power being expressed in the quote, word, footnote two. If God had merely willed to create a world and not by pronouncing the word from his own center, set his will into motion and rendered it active, creation would not have come into actual existence, but remained as a subjective image within the divine mind. The, quote, Father, unquote, is the will, parenthesis, the fire, in parenthesis, the, quote, son, the life, parenthesis, light, sound, intelligence, in parenthesis, and the Holy Ghost is the power manifested by the fire and the light. The radiance which constitutes the world of effects therefore everything in nature is holy unless the holy will of god has become perverted and rendered unholy therein and footnote or fiat parenthesis active and efficient thought and parenthesis in the same manner as if a house would come into existence by a breath footnote three by the breath outbreathing of Brahma and footnote the cause of the beginning of creation was in the eternal inherent activity of the immaterial essence and all things were invisibly or potentially contained in the first cause or God footnote four this would sound like blank materialism if we were to leave out of sight that God being everything in the absolute is not only absolute motion but absolute wisdom quote God is the will of divine wisdom, unquote. Without the wisdom of God, no wisdom could have become manifested, neither in nature nor in the head and heart of a man. Paracelsus nowhere states that nature created itself. God is the cause of all existence. Nevertheless, he does not make all things by his own divine power directly and without intermediate agents. Therefore, Paracelsus says, quote, God does not make coats for men. But he gives to the tailor the talent which enables him to learn how to make a coat." Unquote. Misunderstandings in regard to occult truths often arise, because many persons are not able or willing to see beyond merely superficial causes. End footnote. When creation took place, the elaster divided itself, it's so to say, melted and dissolved. And developed out of itself the ideos or chaos parenthesis mysterium magnum iliados limbus major or primordial matter and parenthesis this primordial essence is of a monistic nature and manifests itself not only as vital activity a spiritual force an invisible incomprehensible and indescribable power but also as vital matter of which the substance of living beings consists Note one. This means that life is the cause of matter and force. Force and matter are originally identical. They are only two different modes of one and the same cause or substance which is called life, and which is itself an attribute or function of the supreme cause of all existence. Modern discoveries go to prove the unity or identity of matter and energy. Recent researches in chemistry and comparisons made between the chemical, musical, and color scales seem to indicate that the cause of the difference between the heterogeneous single bodies 
is not caused by an essential difference of the substances of which they are composed, but only a difference in the number of their atomic vibrations. And footnote. In the limbus or adios of primordial matter invested with the original power of life without form and without any conceivable qualities, in this, the only matrix of all created things, the substance of all things is contained. It is described by the ancients as the chaos and has been compared to a receptacle of germs out of which the macrocosmos and afterward, afterward by division and evolution in mysteria speciala. Footnote 1. Mysterium, quote unquote, is everything out of which something may be developed, which is only germinally contained in it. A seed is the mysterium of a plant, an egg the mysterium of a living bird, etc. If Eastern mythology says that the universe came out of an egg put into the water by Brahma, neuter, or ideation, it implies the same meaning as the mysterium magnum of Paracelsus. Because the egg represents the mysterium, the water of the life, and the spirit hatches out of it the creative god, Brahma. Each sep end footnote, each separate being came into existence. All things and all elementary, all elementary substances were contained in it, in potentia, footnote 2. The elastor of Paracelsus corresponds to the Ev of Pythagoras and Empod Empodocles, and it was Aristotle who spoke first of the form in potentia, before it could appear in actu, the former being called by him, quote, the privation of matter, unquote, and footnote. But not in actu, in the same sense as in a piece of wood, a figure is contained, which may be cut out by an artist, or a seed is contained in a pebble, that may manifest its essence as a spark if struck with a piece of steel, footnote three. The elastor of Paracelsus I already read that footnote. My apologies. The magnum, the magnus limbus, is the seed or nursery out of which all creatures have grown, in the same sense as a tree may grow out of a small seed, with the difference, however, that the great limbus takes its origin from the word of God, while the limbus minor, parenthesis, the terrestrial seed or sperm, and parenthesis, takes it from the earth. The great limbus is the seed out of which all beings have come, and the little limbus is each ultimate being that reproduces its form, and that has itself been produced by the great. The little limbus has all the quali qualifications of the great one, in the same sense as a son has an organization similar to that of his father. As it is above, so it is below. Quote, the limbus is the prima materia of man, and therefore the physician should know what the limbus is, for that which the limbus is, is also the man, and he who knows the former knows also the latter. The limbus is heaven and earth, the upper and lower spheres, the four elements and all that is contained therein. Therefore it is properly called, quote, microcosmos, unquote, for it is the whole world. Parenthesis, de originem morb matrix. And parenthesis. As creation took place and the elastor dissolved, Aries, the dividing, differentiating, and individualizing power of the supreme cause, began to act. All production took place in consequence of separation. There were produced out of the ideos the elements of fire, water, air, and earth, whose birth, however, did not take place in material mode or by simple separation but spiritually and dynamically, just as fire may come out of a pebble or a tree come out of a seed, although there is originally no fire in the pebble nor a tree in the seed. Quote, spirit is living and life is spirit, and life and spirit produce all things, but they are essentially one and not two. The tongue talks, and yet it does not talk, for it is the spirit that talks through the tongue, and without, and without the spirit the tongue would be silent because the flesh alone cannot talk." Unquote. The elements, too, have each one its own elastor, because all the activity of matter in every form is only an effluvium of the same fountain. But as from the seed grow the roots with their fibers, afterwards the stalk with its branches and leaves, 
and lastly, the flowers and seeds. Likewise, all beings were born from the elements and consist of elementary substances out of which other forms may come into existence, bearing the characteristics of their parents. Footnote 1. This doctrine, preached 300 years ago, is identical with the one that has revolutionized modern thought after having been put into a new shape and elaborated by Darwin, and is still more elaborated by the Indian Kapila in the Sak Sakya philosophy. Sankhya philosophy, my apologies, and footnote. The elements as the mothers of all creatures are of an invisible spiritual nature and have souls. Footnote 2. Quote, an element is nothing else but soul. This is not to be understood as if it were the eternal soul, but the soul of the elements is the life of all creatures. The fire which burns is not the element of the fire, as we see it, but the soul is therein and is its element. It is invisible to us and the life of the fire. Unquote. This element may be either active or passive. Quote, the element of fire is in the wood no less than in the fire. But the life in the wood is not as it is in the fire. Thus there is a difference between the life and the soul. If the fire lives, then does it burn. But if it is in the soul, it is then in its element and without burning. All that grows is out of the element of fire. That which is freed is out of the element of the earth. That which nourishes is out of that of air. And that which consumes is out of the element of water. Parenthesis. Philosophers at Anthon, Volume 6, in parenthesis. They all spring, and therefore the spiritual elements, and all the beings that have been formed of such elements, must be eternal, just as a flower consists of elements similar to those of the plant on which it grows. Quote, Nature being the universe is one, and its origin can only be one eternal unity. It is an organism in which all natural things harmonize and sympathize with each other. It is the macrocosm. Everything is the product of one universal creative effort. The macrocosm and man, the microcosm, are one. They are one constellation, one influence, one breath, one harmony, one time, one metal, one fruit. Footnote 1. This description of the sympathy existing between man and eternal nature recalls to memory the old Greek words that I cannot pronounce here of Hippocrates describing works of Hippocrates and it especially reminds us of the Timaeus of Plato and the Emirates of Plodon in which works the whole of nature is represented as a living and rational being having come into existence by the will of the supreme cause. The head of man is there pictured as being an imitation of the peripheric constitution of the world. The basis of the natural philosophy of Paracelsus is the evidently existing correspondence, correlation, and harmony existing between the human constitution and the constitution of the starry world, including all terrestrial things. And this philosophy is almost identical with that of Plato, which speaks of the formation of all things in the inner world according to eternal patterns existing in the realm of the pure ideal. In parentheses, Philosophia ad Athenensis, in parentheses, there is nothing dead in nature. Everything is organic and living, and consequently, the whole world appears to be a living organism. Quote, there is nothing corporeal which does not possess a soul hidden in it. There exists nothing in which is not a hidden principle of life. Not only the things that move, such as men and animals, the worms of the earth, and the, burns, the birds of the air, and the fishes in the water, but all corporeal and essential things have life. Unquote. There is no death in nature, and the dying of the beings consists, consists in their return into the body of their mother. That is to say, in an extinction and suppression of one form of existence and activity, and in a rebirth of the same thing into another and more interior world, in a new form, possessed of new faculties that are adapted to its new surroundings. Quote, Two factors are discernible in each thing, its body, form, and its activity. 
qualities. The latter is nothing else but an affluence of the supreme cause, because everything exists from the beginning in God, into whose un unmanifested state all things will return in the end, and from whose power they all receive their qualities, or whatever they deserve on account of their capacity to receive or attract it." Unquote. <clears throat> life is an universal omnipresent principle, and nothing is without life. Quote, it cannot be denied that the air gives life to all corporeal and essential things, such as grow from the earth and are born from it. But the especial life of each thing is a spiritual being, an invisible and intangible spirit. There is nothing corporeal which is not within itself a spiritual essence, and there is nothing which does not contain a life hidden within. Life is something spiritual, neither is life only in that which moves, such as in men and animals, but in all things. For what would a corporeal form be without a spirit? The form may be destroyed, but the spirit remains and is living, for it is the subjective life. There are as many spirits and lives as there are corporeal forms. Therefore, there are celestial, infernal, and human spirits, spirits of metals, stones, plants, etc. The spirit is the life and the balsam within, within all corporeal things. Unquote. Parenthesis, Veda Rerum, Book 4, and parenthesis. In some forms, life acts slowly, for instance, in stones, in others, parenthesis, organized beings, in parenthesis, it acts quickly. Each element has its own peculiar living existences, belonging to it exclusively, footnote 1. For instance, fishes in the water, blood corpuscles in the air, and immaculae and putrid fluids, bacteria and impure air, etc., etc. Quote, you should know that God has left nothing empty, but that he created within all elements. Let me reread that. But that he has created beings within all elements. Princess, planes of existence, and princess. Not only unreasonable, but also reasonable ones. Fishes in the water and the talpa in the earth. Matena in the air and Tordileos in heaven. Moreover, sensitive creatures in a spiritual state, nymphs in the water, gnomes in the earth, lemurs in the air, and in heaven, penates. That which we see in a gross form in the lower sphere indicates to us that which exists in a refined form in the upper region. Unquote. Meteorum Book 4. and footnote 1. Such existences or beings living in the invisible elements are the elemental spirits of nature. They are beings of the mysterious special soul forms which will return into their chaos and are not capable of manifesting any higher spiritual activity because they do not possess the necessary kind of constitution in which an activity of a spiritual character can manifest itself. Otherwise they live like animals or even like human beings and they propagate their species by the knowledge of ether, parenthesis, akasa, in parenthesis, we may come, to, come into contact with such beings, and there are some of them that know all the mysteries of the elements. Footnote 1. Each elemental may know the mysteries of that element to which it belongs. End footnote. Quote, Matter is, so to say, coagulated smoke, and is connected with spirit by an intermediate principle which it receives from the spirit. This intermediate link between matter and spirit belongs to all three kingdoms of nature. In the mineral kingdom, it is called stenar or trogat, footnote 2. The astral body, linga sharira, of minerals, plants, and animals, and footnote 2. In the vegetable kingdom, lefas, footnote 3, astral protoplasm, and footnote, and it forms in connection with the vital forces of the vegetable kingdom, the premium ends which possesses the highest medicinal properties. Footnote 4. Perhaps this may serve as a clue to explain the action of homeopathic medicines. And footnote. This invisible ethereal body may be resurrected and made visible from the ashes of plants and animals by alchemical manipulations. The form of the original body may thus be made to appear and disappear. Footnote 1. If we compare the teachings of the Eastern sages with the cosmology taught by Paracelsus 
and substitute the Sanskrit or the, or the Tibetan terms used by the former for those invented by the latter, we find the two systems almost, if not wholly, identical. According to the Eastern sages, there is a ceaseless activity going on during the state of Pralaya, the night of Brahm, in that incomprehensible eternal first cause that may be looked upon in one of its many aspects as being matter, motion, and space, in an absolute sense, which is beyond the grasp of our relative conception. Its motion is the unconscious latent life inherent in it. This is the elastor of Paracelsus, the root of matter, or Mula Prak Prakriti of the Vendantins, out of which Prakriti, matter, and Purusha, space, become manifest as body and form. In this, the absolute, infinite, and unconditioned, being the endless aggregation of everything conditioned and finite, the germ or potentialities of all things are contained. It is the limbus chaos of Paracelsus, and the germs contained in it are developed by the action of the universal mind, Dian Ko Koans, and the power of wisdom, Fohat, to use the Tibetan words. Thus the universe may be said to be a product of cosmic ideation and cosmic energy, acting not at random or in an arbitrary manner, but according to a certain order produced by previous causes, which are themselves the effects of other causes, and which constitute the law. The effects of other causes, and which const... Let me reread that sentence. The existence of this inevitable and unchangeable law is frequently alluded to by Paracelsus. He says, for instance, in his book, quote, De origine morborum invisibilium, unquote, does not Holy Writ say that God spoke, Am I not the God who made the dumb and the deaf, the blind and the seeing? What else does this mean but that he is the creator of all things, of good and of evil? Unquote. The writings of the Buddhists teach the same doctrine, saying that there is only one power, Svahavat. It cannot act otherwise than according to the law of cause and effect, and that makes a useful tree grow as well as a useless stone in the bladder according to the causes that have been produced by previous effects. Each act and each thought has a cause, and the cause of the cause is the law. The identity of the doctrines of Paracelsus with those of the Eastern sages has been supposed to prove that he, that he was taught these things in the East. Nevertheless, this is not necessarily true, for to the open spiritual understanding of man, God is as near in the West as he is in the East. He who is capable to open his eyes may see the sun himself and does not need to be informed about its existence by somebody having seen the sun in a foreign country. End note. In the animal kingdom, this semi-material body is called a vestrum, and in human beings it is called the sidereal man. Each living being is connected with the macrocosmos and microcosmos by means of this intermediate element or soul belonging to the Mysterium Magnum from whence it has been received, and whose form and qualities are determined by the quality and quantity of the spiritual material elements. As all things come from the same source, containing the primordial substance of all things, they are all intimately related to each other and connected with each other, and are essentially and fundamentally a unity. Any difference existing between two dissimilar things arises only from a difference in the forms in which the primordial essence manifests its activity. Such a difference is caused by the different grades through which such forms have passed in the progress of their evolution and development. Man, as such, is the highest being in existence, because in him nature has reached the culmination of her evolutionary efforts. In him are contained all the powers and all the substances that exist in the world, and he constitutes a world of his own. In him wisdom may become manifest, and the powers of his soul, good as well as evil, may be developed to an extent little dreamed of by our speculative philosophers. Quote, in him are contained all the celestia terrestria, undusa and area. Unquote. That is to say, all the forces and beings and forms that may be found in the four elements out of which the universe is constructed. Man is the microcosm containing in himself the types of all the creatures that exist in the world. Quote, and it is a great truth which you should seriously consider that there is nothing in heaven or upon the earth which does not also exist in man, 
and God who is in heaven exists also in man, and the two are but one. Unquote. Quote, man is a being and contains many beings within his constitution. Nevertheless, he is only one individual. These beings within himself, within him, are himself, and yet they are not his true self. There are many distinct lives within one life, and in the same sense, there are many deities in the world, but only one God. Each man in his capacity as a member of the great organism of the world can be truly known only if looked upon in his connection with universal nature, and not as a separate being isolated from nature. Man is dependent for his existence on nature, and the state of nature depends, depends on the condition of mankind as a whole. If we know nature, we know man, and if we know man, we know nature." Unquote. Whoever desires to be a practical philosopher ought to be able to indicate heaven and hell in the microcosm, and to find everything in man that exists in heaven or upon the earth, so that the corresponding things of the one and the other appear to him as one, separated by nothing else but the form. He must be able to turn the exterior into the interior. But this is an art which he can only acquire by experience and by the light of nature, which is shining before the eyes of every man. Footnote 1. Thus a man in whom supreme wisdom or God has become fully manifest is a God to the extent of his wisdom, and the power which he can exercise will extend as far as the power manifested through him will reach. A man will become an inner incarnation of good or evil according to the degree in which the good or evil existing in the universe becomes manifested through him. But as no one can become a Christ by merely speculating upon the doctrines of Christ without practicing them, so nobody, nobody can come into possession of practical knowledge by merely accepting a creed or a belief in the scientific opinions of others without any experience of his own. And footnote 1 but which is seen by few." End quote. The science which deals with the comparison of the microcosm and macrocosm for the purpose of elucidating the nature of the two, parenthesis, which are in reality one, end parenthesis, and to bring to an understanding the rational principle governing their activity, is called by Paracelsus astronomia, and this term is not to be confounded with, mod confounded with modern physical astronomy, or the science of the revolutions of the suns and planets in cosmic space. Neither does it refer to the mathematical astrological science of the 16th century. The astronomy of Paracelsus means wisdom, or a direct recognition of the truth, caused by a just appreciation and comprehension of the relationship existing between the macrocosmos and the microcosmos, quote, whereby the nature of man becomes known through an understanding of the upper sphere of the great world, as well as by investigating the lower sphere of his little world as if they were apparently parenthesis, what they are essentially and parenthesis, one firmament footnote one one world and footnote one star one being although appearing temporarily in a divided form and shape unquote. footnote two quote liber paramirum unquote cap number two this is the fundamental doctrine of the teachings of paracelsus the macrocosm and the microcosm may not, not only be compared together, but they are, in one rea they are one in reality, divided only by form. This is essentially Vedantic doctrine. And footnote 2. The astronomy of Paracelsus is based upon the observation of what takes place in the universal mind, of which the mind of man is a reflected image. Modern astronomy has nothing to do with the soul and the life of things. It merely watches and calculates external effects. The sphere of the universal mind is the upper firmament, and the sphere of the individual mind the lower firmament, but the two are intimately connected together and are essentially one. Quote, it is the knowledge of the upper outer firmament that enables us to know the lower inner firmament in man, and which teaches in what manner the former continually acts upon and interrelates with the latter. Unquote. Upon this knowledge, the true science of astrology is based. Each, however, the microcosmos as well as the macrocosmos, are to be looked upon as having each a separate and independent existence, and as being independent of each other, each one by reason of the individuality of its own inherent power, notwithstanding the fact that both have the same origin and the same life, for the one primordial power 
has become differentiated in each separate form, and its original homogeneous action has become modified by the special qualities that have been acquired by the forms in which it manifests itself. Quote, As the sky with its stars and constellations is nothing separate from the all, but includes the all, so is the firmament of man not separated from man. And as the universal mind is not ruled by any external existence, likewise, the firmament in man, his individual sphere of mind, is not subject to the rule of any creature, but is an independent and powerful whole. Footnote 1 This fundamental truth of occultism is allegorically represented in the interlaced double triangles. He who has succeeded in bringing his individual mind in exact harmony with the universal mind has succeeded in reuniting the inner sphere with the outer one, from which he has only become separated by mistaking illusions for truths. He who has succeeded in carrying out practically the meaning of this symbol has become one with the Father. He is virtually an adept because he has succeeded in squaring the circle and circling the square. And footnote. The practical application of astronomia is called magic and Kabbalah, a science which by investigating the parts of the whole leads to a comparison of their ideal relations and connections, and consequently to a recognition of their inner nature. Quote, Hidden things of the soul, which cannot be perceived by the physical senses, may be found through the sidereal body, through whose organism we may look into nature in the same way as the sun shines through a glass. The inner nature of everything may therefore be known through magic in general, and through the powers of the inner or second sight. Footnote 1. If the individual mind is one with the universal mind, and if the possessor of the individual mind wishes to find out some secret of nature, he does not require to seek for it outside of the sphere of his mind, but he looks for it in himself, because everything that exists in nature, in parenthesis, which is a manifestation of the universal mind, in parenthesis, exists in and is reflected by himself. And the idea of there being two minds is only an illusion. The two are one. And footnote. These are the powers by which all secrets of nature may be discovered, and it is necessary that a physician should be instructed and become well versed in this art, and that he should be able to find out a great deal more about the patient's disease by his own inner perception than by questioning the patient. For this inner sight is the astronomy of medicine, and as physical anatomy shows all the inner parts of the body, such as cannot be seen through the skin, so this magic perception shows not only all the causes of disease, but it furthermore discovers the elements and medicinal substances in which the healing powers reside. Footnote 2 It would be difficult to find many practitioners of medicine possessed of genuine powers of, of troops. Let me reread that sentence. It would be difficult to find many practitioners of medicine possessed of genuine powers of true spiritual perception. But it is a universally recognized fact that a physician without intuition parenthesis, common sense, end parenthesis, will not be very successful. Even if he knew all medical books by heart, we should be guided by wisdom but not by opinions. The opinions of others may serve us, but we should not be subservient to them. And footnote 2. That which gives healing power to a medicine is its spiritus, parenthesis, an ethereal essence or principle, in parenthesis, and it is only perceptible by the senses of the sidereal man. It therefore follows that magic is a teacher of medicine for pref far preferable to all written books. Footnote 3. No man who has not become regenerated in the spirit can exercise any spiritual, i.e. magical powers. He cannot use that which he does not possess. For this reason, our modern skeptics are perfectly justifiable in denying the existence of magic, because the true understanding is a power which belongs only to God and man and not to the animal, and consequently magic does not exist for them. End footnote 3. 
magic power alone that can neither be conferred by the universities nor created by the awarding of diplomas, but which comes from God, that was in parentheses, is the true teacher, preceptor, and pedagogue to teach the art of curing the sick. As the physical forms and colors of objects, or as the letters of a book, can be seen with the physical eye, so the essence and the character of all things may be recognized and become known by the inner sense of the soul. Footnote 1. Von Eckerstausen describes this inner sense as follows, quote, It is the center of all senses, or the inner faculty of man, whereby he is able to feel the impressions produced by the exterior senses. It is the formative imagination of man, whereby the various impressions that have been received through the outer senses are identical and brought into the inner field of consciousness. It is the faculty through which the spirit interprets the language of nature to the soul. It changes bodily sensations into spiritual perceptions and passing impressions into lasting images. All the senses of man originate in one sense, which is sensation. Unquote. And footnote. Quote, I have reflected a great deal upon the magical powers of the soul of man, and I have discovered a great many secrets in nature, and I will tell you that he, can, he only can be a true physician who has acquired this power. If our physicians did possess it, their books might be burned and their medicines be thrown into the ocean, and the world would be all the more benefited by it. Magic in Ventrix finds everywhere what is needed, and more than will be required. The soul does not perceive the external or internal physical construction of herbs and roots, but it intuitively perceives their powers and virtues, and recognizes at once their signatum. Quote, this signatum, or signature, in parentheses, is a certain organic vital activity, giving to each natu natural object, parenthesis, in con contradistinction to artificially made objects, in parenthesis, a certain similarity with a certain condition produced by disease, and through which health may be restored in specific diseases in the disease part. This signatum is often expressed even in the exterior form of things, and by observing that form, we may learn something in regard to their interior qualities, even without using our interior sight. We see that the internal character of a man is often expressed in his exterior appearance, even in the manner of his walking and in the sound of his voice. Likewise, the hidden character of things is to a certain extent expressed in their outward forms. As long as man remained in a natural state, he recognized the signatures of things and knew their true character. But the more he diverged from the path of nature, and the more his mind became, capt became captivated by elusive external appearances, the more this power became lost. Quote, a man who wholly belongs to himself cannot belong to anything else. Man has the power of self-control, and no external influences can control him if he exercises this power. This power. The influences of the macrocosm cannot so easily impress their action upon a rational, wise, and passionless man as they do upon animals, vegetables, and minerals, which they impregnate to such an extent that their characters may be seen in the forms, colors, and shapes, and be perceived by the odor and taste of such objects. Some of these external signs are universally known. For instance, the age of an elk is indicated by the number of the ends and the shape of its horns. Other symbols may require a special study for their true interpretation." Unquote. This science, resulting from a comparison of the external appearance of a thing and its true character, is called by Paracelsus their anatomy. There are even, there are even to this day a great many vegetable medicines used in, used in the prevailing system of medicine whose mode of action is not known, and for whose employment no other reason has been given but that the exterior shapes of such plants correspond to a certain extent to the form of the organs upon which they are supposed to be acting beneficially, and because experience has supported such a belief. Quote, den naturira rerum, unquote, footnote one. In Babbitt's, quote, principles of light and color, unquote, it is demonstrated that each ray of color has a certain therapeutic influence on the human system, 
blue acting soothingly on the circulation of the blood, red stimulating, yellow acting as a purgative, etc. He gives some interesting examples of correspondences between the colors and medicinal qualities of certain flowers, plants, drugs, etc., with the action of the above-named color rays. End footnote. Each plant is, a, is in a sympathetic, wait, quote, each plant is in a sympathetic relation with the macrocosm and consequently also with the microcosm, or in other words, with the constellation and organism. Parenthesis, for the activity of the organism of man is the result of the actions of the interior constellation of stars. Footnote 2. Existing in his interior world. End parenthesis. Footnote 2. Before we make up our mind to laugh at these so-called, quote, superstitions, quote, unquote, of the signatures, we should try to realize that each form is the external expression of a certain character. But what is character? Unless a certain condition of, quote, spirit or will. Unquote. Each state of man's body, either in health or disease, is also a certain condition of that will which constitutes his very self. He himself, as well as all other, all other things in the world, is a form or a certain quality of will, mind, or consciousness. Reasoning from this basis, and taking into consideration the well-known law of induction, it will not be difficult to find an explanation how one quality of will can act upon another such quality and why the quality of a plant may be known by beholding ex its external shape. And footnote two. And each plant may be considered to be a terrestrial star. Each star in the great firmament and in the firmament of man has its specific influence, and each plant likewise, and, in the, and the two correspond together. If we knew exactly the relations between plants and stars, we might say this star is, quote, Stella Roris Marini, that plant is Stella absinthi, and so forth. In this way, an herbarium spiritualis siderium might be collected, such as every intelligent physician who understands the relationship existing between matter and mind should possess. Footnote 1. Eckerstausen has made such an herbarium. He gives the names of medicinal plants and the names of the planets with which they are sympathetically connected. And footnote 1. Because no man can rationally employ remedies without knowing their qualities, and he, he cannot know the qualities of plants without being able to read their signatures, it is useless for a physician to read the books of Discordes and Makar, and to learn from hearsay the opinions of others who may be as inferiors in wisdom. He ought to look with his own eyes into the book of nature, and become able to understand it, but to do this requires more than mere speculation and to ransack one's brain. And yet, without that art, nothing useful can be accomplished. Unquote. But this harmony existing between the form and the character is furthermore remarkable in certain other conditions and qualities, which are often of more importance to a physician than the external shapes. Quote, if, the, if the physician understands the anatomy of medicines and the anatomy of diseases, he will find by genetic... He will find that a concordance exists between the two. Footnote 2. The expression, quote, anatomy means the knowledge of the parts of which a thing is composed, not merely the, the, not merely the external visible parts, but also its soul and internal qualities. For the soul and the spirit of a thing are as much parts of it as the external appearance is known to modern anatomy. And footnote 2. There is not only a general relationship existing between the macrocosm and the microcosm, but a separate and intimate interrelation and interaction exists between their separate parts, each part of the great organism acting upon the corresponding part of the small organism, in the same sense as the various organs of the human body, are intimately connected and in influencing each other, and manifesting a sympathy with each other that may continue to exist even after such organs have been separated from the trunk." Unquote. There is a great sympathy existing between the stomach and the brain, between the mammae and the uterus, between the lungs and the heart. Footnote 1. Dr. J. R. Buchanan, in his, quote, therapeutic sarco sarcognomy, unquote, makes practical use of the sympathetic relationship existing between the various parts of the human body.
I apologize for the pause. And footnote. There is furthermore a great sympathy existing between the planets and stars and the organs of the human body. Such a sympathy exists between the stars and the plants, between stars and stars, between plants and plants, and between the plants and the organs of the human body, in consequence of which relationship each body may produce certain changes in the activity of life in another body that is in sympathy with the former. Footnote 2. There is, in fact, a universal sympathy and mutual interaction and relationship existing everywhere in the universe between such forms or qualities of will as are identified or harmonious in their nature, as are identical or harmonious in their nature. Therefore, that which is good attracts the good, and that which is evil, the evil. He who loves God, in him the divine will becomes active, and to him who worships the devil, in his heart the devil will be attracted. And footnote 2. Thus may the action of certain specific medicines and certain diseases be explained. As a bar of magnetized iron may induce magnetism in another bar of iron, but leave copper and brass unaffected, likewise a certain plant possessing certain powers may induce certain similar vital powers to become active in certain organs if the plant and the organ are related to the same star. Certain plants may therefore act as antidotes in certain diseases in the same manner as fire will destroy all things that have not the power to resist it. The neutralization, destruction, or removal of any specific elements producing disease, the change of an unhealthy and abnormal action of the vital principle into a normal and healthy state, the action of one kind of will upon another kind, constitutes the basis of the therapeutic system of Paracelsus. His object was to re-establish in the diseased organism the necessary equilibrium and to restore the lost vitality by attracting the vital principles from living objects and powers. Remedies containing the required quality of that principle in the greatest quantity were most apt to replace such lost powers and to restore health. The organisms, that is to say, the material forms of invisible principles, take their origin from the soul of the world, symbolized as water. This doctrine of Paracelsus is therefore the same as the ancient doctrine of Thales and as the old Brahminical doctrine according to which the world came into existence from an egg parenthesis, allegorically speaking and parenthesis, laid in water parenthesis, the soul by Brahm wisdom and parenthesis. He says that by the decomposition of that essence a mucilage quote, is formed unquote containing the germs of life out of which, by generatio equivoca, first the lower and afterward the higher organisms are formed. We see, therefore, that the doctrine of Paracelsus bears a great resemblance to the one advocated by the greatest modern philosophers, such as Haeckel and Darwin. With that difference, however, that Paracelsus looks upon the continually evoluting forms as necessary vehicles of a continually progressing living spiritual principle, seeking higher modes for its manifestation. While many of our modern speculative, speculative philosophers look upon the intelligent principle of life as not existing, and upon life as being merely a manifestation of chemical and physical activity of dead matter in an incomprehensible and causeless state of development. Footnote 1. The same doctrine of creation and subsequent evolution has been nowhere better explained than by Jakob Burma, an illumined seer from which the great majority of our modern philosophers have borrowed their ideas. He says, quote, The constellation is the external outspoken word, the instrument, instrument through which the holy eternally speaking word speaks and produces forms externally. It is like a great harmony of many voices and musical instruments playing before God. They are interacting powers, wherein the essence of sound is the substance, and this is taken up by the desire as the fiat and causes corporeality. This substance is the astral spirit. In it the elements become coagulated, corporified, and in that substance forms are born, comparable to the hatching of an egg brooded over by a hen. Parenthesis Mysterium Magnum, unquote. Page 11 and 26, and parenthesis and footnote. Quote, According to the biblical account, God created the animals before he created man. 
the animal elements, instincts, and desires existed before the divine spirit illuminated them and made them into man. The animal soul of man is derived from the cosmic animal elements, and the animal kingdom is therefore the father of the animal man. If man is like his animal father, he resembles an animal. If he is like the divine spirit that may shine through his animal elements, he is like a god. If his reason is absorbed by his animal instincts, it becomes animal reason. If it rises above his animal desires, it becomes angelic. If a man eats the flesh of an animal, the animal flesh becomes human flesh. If an animal eats human flesh, the latter becomes animal flesh. A man who's, whose human reason is stifled by his animal desires is an animal. And if his animal reason gives way to wisdom, he becomes an angel." Unquote. Quote, animal man is the son of the animal elements out of which his soul was born, and animals are the mirrors of man. Whatever animal elements exist in the world exist in the soul of man, and therefore the character of one man may resemble that of a fox, a dog, a snake, a parrot, etc. Man need not therefore be surprised that animals have animal instincts that are so much like his own. It might rather be surprising for the animals to see that their son, animal man, resembles them so closely. Animals follow their animal instincts, and in doing so, they act so nobly and stand as high in nature as their position in it permits them. And they do not sink thereby below that position. It is only animal man who may sink below the brute. Animals love and hate each other according to the attraction or repulsion of their animal, element, animal elements. The dog loves the dog and hates the cat and men and women are attracted to each other by their animal instincts, and love their young ones for the same reason as the animals love theirs. But such a love is animal love. It has its purposes and its rewards, but it dies when the animal elements die. Man is derived from the dog, and not the dog from the man. Therefore, a man may act like a dog, but a dog cannot act like a man. Man may learn from the animals, for they are his, for they are his parents. But the animals can learn nothing useful to them from man. The spider makes a better web than man, and the bee builds a more artistic house. He may learn how to run from the horse, to swim from the fish, and to fly from the eagle. The animal world is taught by nature, and it is divided into many classes and species, so that it may learn all the natural arts. Each species has forms that differ from those of another species, so that it may learn that art for which it is adapted by nature. But man as a whole has only one kind of form, and it is not divided, and therefore the animal soul of man is not divided, but all the animal elements are combined in it, the reason of man selecting what it likes." Unquote. And footnote 1, Quote, As there is a love between animals, so that they long to dwell and cohabit together as males and females, so there is such an animal love among men and women, which they have inherited from the animals. It is a deadly love which cannot be carried higher and belongs merely to the animal nature of man. It springs from animal reason, and as animals love and hate each other, so does animal man. Dogs envy and bite each other, and in so far as men envy and fight each other, they are the descendants of dogs. Thus one man is a fox, another a wolf, another a bear, etc. Each one has certain animal elements in him, and if he allows them to grow in him and identifies himself with them, he is then fully that which he is identified. Unquote. De fundamento sapiente. Un, in, unquote. In parenthesis. In footnote one. Quote. A man who loves to lead an animal life is an animal ruled by his interior animal heaven. The same stars, influences that cause a wolf to murder, a dog to steal, a cat to kill, a bird to sing, etc., make a man a singer, an eater, a talker, a lover, a murderer, a robber, or a thief. These are animal attributes, and they die with the animal elements to which they belong. But the divine principle in man, which constitutes him a human being, and by which he is eminently distinguished from the animals, is not a product of the earth, nor is it generated by the animal kingdom, but it comes from God. It is God, and it is immortal, because coming from a divine source, it cannot be otherwise than divine. Man should therefore live in harmony with his divine parent, and not in the animal elements of his soul. Man has an eternal father, who sent him to reside and gain experience in the animal principles, but not for the purpose of being absorbed by them. 
because in the latter case man would become an animal, while the animal principle would have nothing to gain, unquote, and would thus be led individually to speedy annihilation. Uh, parenthesis de fundamento sapiente, and parenthesis, uh, this is the end of the book, or the end of the chapter of the book Cosmology within the Life and Doctrines of Paracelsus, written by Franz Hartmann.